Greetings and welcome to worship as we celebrate our worship today, the eighth Sunday after the Pentecost. Um, my name is Gary Stevenson, me I'm O'Gary Stevenson. Today we have Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven, and he uses a variety of parables to describe the kingdom of heaven. So that's what we'll be looking at today in our sermon. Listen closely not only to the gospel reading from Matthew, but we also have some promising words from St. Paul as well, as Paul reminds us that nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love. Amen. Again, welcome. Welcome to the service of worship for Sunday, July 26th. We're so glad that you could join us. People of hope, we miss you. We're here. We are church together wherever we are. Wanted to let you know a little bit of an update. We've got a survey coming out. We want to check in with you all, see what you're thinking about returning to worship, when that's safe, when that's legal, when that's allowed, when that's recommended. And so we're going to be sending out a survey both online through our email blast and social media um, outlets and also hard copies for those of you who would prefer to return it that way. If you could fill that out sometime in the next couple weeks and send it back, it just gives us sort of an ability to check the pulse of our congregation to see where all of you are. Welcome to worship. I'd like to uh, offer a greeting this morning in Spanish for folks who are joining us. Muy bienvenidos, buenos días a todos ustedes. Estamos agradecidos que puedan acompañarnos en este día. Estamos la iglesia, todos juntos, aunque no estamos en el mismo lugar. Estamos juntos en el Espíritu Santo. Hoy vamos a bendecir el nombre del Señor. Vamos a oír en la Palabra Santa y vamos a ser la iglesia. Vamos a ser los discípulos donde quiera que estemos nosotros en nuestras vidas. Estamos juntos en el Espíritu. We're glad that you're here with us this day. Welcome. Welcome to worship. Please join me in a word of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hopes in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of God's mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. It's time for the children's sermon. My name is Krista Slater, and I am the Director of Children's Ministries here at Hope. I'm full of questions, so I have another one for you today. To you, what does God look like? Or who is God to you? I wish I could hear your answers. Um, if any of you join me on Zoom, um, maybe we can talk about that next Tuesday. To me, God, when I was younger, God was mostly brought to me through Jesus. So I thought of a man sitting with me uh, or praying with me when I, was, when I was younger, which is kind of, maybe it sounds kind of strange, but it was very comforting. Um, now I kind of see God as a light that wraps around me when I go to pray. So I wish I could hear your answers, but there's mine. One more question. What does God's kingdom look like to you? This might be a, a different kind of question. It might be kind of hard. Maybe you haven't thought about it a lot. Maybe it's actually a castle or, or like a kingdom. Or maybe it's a fortress. Or I, I don't know. I wish I could hear your answers. To me, God's kingdom looks like this church. And that's kind of confusing, but I see God and God's works through other people. One more question. So what does a mustard seed, treasure, a merchant, and a fishnet have in common? Any guesses? This is the hardest question I think I have for you. And if you have no idea, I think that's okay. Maybe you'll get it after our reading today. In the lesson, um, that Pastor Gary is going to read today, Jesus describes this kingdom of God in many specific ways because words just can't dis describe God's kingdom. It's amazing. So the first thing that Jesus says is the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. So a mustard seed is really, really small. I don't know if you remember the last two weeks, when I had pumpkin seeds or I was talking about sunflower seeds, which are a little big, like as big as my finger, and this mustard seed would be tiny. It would be like a little speck or a piece of glitter, maybe. So it's really small, but Jesus says that it, can gr it grows. And mustard seeds grow really fast. So God's kingdom is something that is small but important and growing. Another thing that Jesus says is God's kingdom is like a person or a merchant looking for a perfect pearl. And you know what a pearl is? Like from an oyster, maybe in The Little Mermaid or something like that, right? And finally, the merchant finds it and he sells everything just to buy that little pearl. The kingdom of God is so valuable that God will drop anything for anybody, right? Just, just to have us and just to keep us safe. So that's what he's trying to say there. The, one of the last things that he says is the kingdom of God is like a fishing net and catching like all these amazing different kinds of fish. And it's, it's just awesome, right? When you catch a fish, I don't know if any of you have been fishing before. It's an amazing experience, it's exciting. And so the kingdom of God is amazing and it's exciting. God's love is amazing, so I know that God's kingdom is amazing. It's too good for words, which is why Jesus has to tell these stories or give us these little instances or metaphors or similes, if you know anything about those. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's really incredible. I think that's neat that God um, sent Jesus to talk about um, God's kingdom with him, 
and uh, that he tries to tell us through these little stories. It's kind of interesting, and it's, it's really fun. Will you pray with me? Dear God, how amazing you are. You are too wonderful for words. Give us ability to see you in all of your creation. Amen. See you next week. Our first reading is from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the eighth chapter. St. Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. 
And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I had an interesting experience not that long ago. You see, my driver's license was up for renewal on my birthday this year. When I initially received the notice, I wasn't particularly worried. I'd received such notices before. It's really no big deal. I was all ready to go online, make the payment, and then wait patiently for my new license to arrive. But as my birthday approached, I looked more closely at the letter that had been sent and discovered that this year the DMV wanted to see me in person. Not only did they want to take a new picture, they were also requiring me to take the written test as well as a vision test. And so suddenly this task that was usually done without much thought became much more complicated. I haven't done either a, a written or a vision test since I arrived in California in 1989. 
And while I could cram for the written test and likely pass with flying colors, I've worn corrective lenses for almost 60 years now, and I've had five eye surgeries since my last vision test came when I received my license in 1989. Now, no matter how hard I studied, I knew there would be no way that I would be able to improve my eyesight. Not, not that it's completely horrible, but I do have a little bit more trouble seeing now than I did, especially in situations where I'm under fluorescent lights or in dim lit situations, which I've experienced whenever I've gone to a DMV office. That's the only kind of situation I've ever found. And I'm convinced that the DMV puts their eye charts back in the deepest, darkest corners of the building possible, simply to harass people like me. Well, two very fortunate things happened when I went for my appointment. First, due to the COVID-19 virus having shut down the DMV for some time, they waived the written test. In an attempt to separate church and state, I didn't fall on my knees and give up prayer to, prayers of thanksgiving right there in the building. But the second fortunate thing that happened was they led me to a machine where I could look at the eye chart where the letters were all lit up. And so with well-lit letters, I was able to pass my vision test, which means that no one now has to worry about my being on the road with them. I will see you. So how is your vision? I mean, that seems to be a little bit of a, a question that Jesus asks. Jesus is looking for that kind of a response when Jesus talks in about the parables today. And he's asking more ab about vision. He's not talking about how well we can read the letters on the eye chart. This question has more to do with how we see the world. What do we see when we look into the world? Do we think we see a world that's falling apart? The one that's heading to hell in a handbasket? Perhaps we see the most godless world in history. Is that what we see? Is that what fills our vision? Leading us to feelings of despair or worse? If that's what we see, if that's what fills our vision, I suppose that's perfectly understandable. To say that we live in a troubling world is a, is a bit of an understatement. We've all faced challenges before, but I'm uncertain that there's been any time in our nation that has seen anything like what is going on now, at least anyone in our lifetime. I doubt that there are those who are still alive who survived the, the pandemic in 1918 that have much memory of what it was like. And so this is new to them. We are seeing protests in the streets, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1960s, with scenes of violence in the streets of American cities, cities like Portland and Chicago, scenes that we're more accustomed to seeing on the news coming to us from cities in foreign countries. We continue to see the numbers of COVID-19 cases rise around the world, affecting over 15 million individuals worldwide, while taking over 145,000 lives in the United States alone. Even if maybe we haven't had anyone who is close to us die from or even contract a virus, the numbers alone are staggering, perhaps even mocking some of the words of St. Paul in our letter that today from the Romans, where St. Paul writes, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Everything working for good? Is that what we see? Has God's patience finally worn so much that it is worn out? Have we finally stepped across some invisible line out there where God has says, that's enough. Now wait and feel my wrath. Now the case could be made, and, and I would guess that there are some preachers out there that are preaching this message. 
Turn or burn. Put the prayer back in schools and, and get back to church. Do these things or expect more of the same. But the problem with this message is that it flies in the face of the message that we have from Paul, as well as the parables that were recorded in the chapter 13 of Matthew. Paul reminds us to consider the lengths to which God has gone to repair that relationship between God and creation. God did not withhold his own son. If God is willing to go to these lengths to keep us in this relationship, what makes us think that God will suddenly be against us? And Paul continues to remind us that we are loved by God and that there is no situation in life whatsoever, not one, that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even in the midst of a pandemic, with all of its pain and death, God is still for us. Have we ever considered that maybe what we're suffering from are things that we as humans have done? As the Old Testament prophets told the people of Israel, you'll suffer the consequences from generations yet to come. Has our inability to love our neighbor, to love God's creation, and to work for justice for everything, has it finally come to a point where it's catching up with us? Is COVID-19 simply a reminder that our neighbor isn't simply someone who lives right next to us, or even shares our nationality or ethnic background, or even speaks our own language? Is God trying to cure our vision in order for us to take the time that it really takes to look at others long enough to recognize that they too are created in the image of God? Is God working on our vision so that we might see in each other someone deserving love, respect, and justice just as we would wish to have from them? But wait a second, all, all these things, they just, they just seem so small. Could these things really make a difference in the world? Well, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we have Jesus telling the disciples in the crowds, the kingdom of heaven is near. In each of the parables recorded here, Jesus begins with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he goes on to explain. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a one-of-a-kind pearl. The implication seems to be that the kingdom of heaven is present. Look around. How is your vision? Do you see it? The mustard seed is a seed that's small enough to be overlooked, nearly invisible to the naked eye. Despite that, see what can come when it's allowed to grow. Something sturdy enough to provide shelter and protection for some of God's creatures. Yeast, again, nearly invisible to the naked eye, yet something that makes a huge difference in a lump of dough. And so on and so forth throughout the parable that Jesus spoke. Still, I hear people talk about this godless generation in which we live. Some remember fondly when the churches were filled to the brim every Sunday morning, when the church had a say in what went on in the world. Some mourn those days and point to the difference as proof that evil is winning in the world. Is that true? Is evil really winning? Well, if that's what they see, or if that's what we see, perhaps it's time for a vision check. Look around, maybe things aren't what they once were, but that doesn't mean that God isn't doing something new. And God has done something new before, so why not do something new again? And the cross? The cross is our reminder that no matter what evil thinks, the game is over. While battles may still continue to take place, the war is essentially over. It is over, and through Jesus Christ, the victory is secure, and that victory is permanent. So how is your vision? 
Do you see the kingdom of heaven present in the world? If not, I invite you to slow down and see what you are doing in the world in the name of Christ. See what your neighbor is doing in the world in the name of Christ. Even if we can't gather for worship in the words of presiding bishop Elizabeth Eaton of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, remember, the church has never been closed. Because the hungry are still being fed. The poor are still being helped. The sick are still being tended to. As long as we have the vision to share Christ's vision, to do the work of the church, the church will never be closed and will provide the world with a vision of God's love. Amen. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Together in the Spirit, I invite you to join me as we confess our faith this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed, as we proclaim together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. From our many locations, yet held in one body by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need, responding to each petition with the words from Psalm 119. Be gracious to us. For the church, O God of mercy, we pray. Open your word to Christians around the world. Reveal yourself to us in ways both traditional and surprising, in places old and new. Bless our bishops, pastors, deacons, and other church leaders as they face their challenging tasks. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, Be gracious, gracious to us. us. For education and nurture in the church, O oh God of wisdom, we pray. Give us the will to seek your wisdom. Guide the many churches in their uses of technology and show us during this time ways to study your word. As this week, we commemorate 
J.S. Bach, and other musicians accompany all church musicians as they seek to help the church offer its praise. Turn to us, O God. Be, Be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. For the earth, O creative God, we pray. Give to plants and animals the water and land they require. Form us into grateful and healing caretakers of your earth. Bless the efforts of scientists and researchers, especially those seeking a vaccine. Lead all people to honor the scientific discoveries that you grant to humankind. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, Be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. For the nations, O oh God of justice, we pray. Direct leaders of nations to build trust with each other and to resist the ways of violence. Stifle the lust for conquest. Bring, bring peace to the Middle East. Visit the people of Hong Kong. Move us away from racist attitudes and policies. Form our president, governor, and legislators to speak with honesty, to strive for justice, and to work to alleviate the nation's needs. Turn to us, O oh God. Be gracious, Be gracious to us. us. For all in need, O oh God of compassion, we pray. Heal the sick, feed the hungry, house the refugee, comfort the countless thousands who are dealing with the coronavirus. Accompany those living with anxiety and despair. Form us to be your arms of mercy. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. For the youth, O oh God of grace, we pray. Give the youth of afflicted nations an inspiring dream of what their future might be. Give them patience to await a time of safety. Direct all schools from daycare through graduate school to find an acceptable way forward. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. You, O oh God, are our pearl beyond price. You are the tree giving us eternal refuge. Here now we pray the petitions of our hearts. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, Be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. In gratitude for the lives of our beloved dead, we pray that nothing, neither death nor life, will separate us from your love. At the end, gather us with all your saints in light everlasting. Turn to us, O oh God. Be, Be gracious, gracious to, to us. us. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Wherever you are, wherever you go, whatever you do, Christ's Holy Spirit lives within you. The Spirit of God goes with you. God's love, God's peace for all people is with you. And I invite you to find ways to share that peace with your neighbors, with your family, with your friends, with those you encounter in your daily life. The peace of the Christ be with you always. Amen. And I invite you to join me as we continue in prayer. A word of God incarnate. O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light in our dark sky, we praise you for the radiance that from the hallowed page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. Amen. And we continue to pray with the words our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Finally, receive this blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and always. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.